we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about distance because everybody really wanted to know more about distance. That seems to be what everybody thinks is the magic bullet. So if I could just hit it a little further. What I see is 90% of people don't know yet how to use their hands and arms. And they don't know how to create these lever systems. People ask me all the time, Mike, so what do you work on in your golf swing? And I go, well, this. And I go, what's that? So that's my swing. Go, well, how's that your golf swing? Well, see, that's how you shoot a basketball. That's how you throw a baseball. That's how you throw a bowling ball. That's how you serve a tennis ball. It's also how you hit a golf ball. So my right hand is just going like this. Now, when people talk again about flipping, what they mean is the club's coming down and they force the club to go early. And so this, this angle on hinges early. See, if I just let the momentum of the club go and my wrist is relaxed, what happens to the weight of the club? What does the club hit? It goes down and hinges, unhinges, and rehinges. So I'm going to say something here. I want to see you flip a lot. It's just when it flips. And I'm going to teach you in a minute how to coordinate the action of your hands, the momentum of the club hit, and what your body's doing. It's a pretty simple movement pattern. And most people, again, don't, spend, don't pay any attention to it because they're trying to do things not relevant to this particular pattern. So that's not a flip. This is not a flip. Flip relates to, in golf, relative to the angle of your wrist unhinging a little early. Well, if you force the club to go, that might happen. But when I swing, I let the weight of the club swing. So I'm just directing the momentum and I let it go. And the momentum of the club whoop, straightens my arms out of the ball. So it's not going to go this way because the momentum of the club won't let it do it. So if you learn to use the momentum of the club, it times the release pattern in your hands, or the action of your hands. So there is a point in time, once you get the momentum of the club working correctly, that you feel like your hands are really quiet. The reality is they're not quiet. They're just not having to force or catch the club up because you're learning how to use the momentum of the club. All these tour players are masters at learning how to direct momentum get it into a pretty good arc where the momentum of the club and the speed they generate makes a lot of things happen for them. Most amateurs are terrible at that. Okay, so we talked about, we talked a little bit about how your wrists work. Right now, the other thing relative to creating maximum speed is center face hits. So when you swing a golf club, you're not hitting the ball in the center of the club face. You're not going to get a lot of speed out of it. So there's a lot of drills to do at home. You can set up a cup of tea and just put your club between the tees and make swings and see if you can make the club go between the tees. So you're hitting the ball in the center of the face. Right, so once you get where the lever starts to work correctly, then you start to get your path of your club to work right. So now you gotta get your arm swinging in the right arc, which is a huge deal. Now, this is where we start to involve your body. And here's what's interesting. We talk about the importance of turn. Here's what I found. A lot of people are trying to tell themselves how to do something they already know how to do. And so if I tried to explain to you how to walk, and I did it in an anatomical format, in a scientific format, and you listened to it, then I had you repeat it and repeat the muscle firing pattern as you tried to lift your foot. You'd probably stand there and you'd all of a sudden you couldn't walk. Because now you're trying to process a pattern that you already know how to do. And so what happens is you get locked up. All right, so if I had somebody stand with their hands here and you're holding something. And I said, well, okay, we're going to take this and we're going to put it on a shelf back here. So put it on this shelf. And they put it on the shelf and say, okay, did your body turn? I go, yeah, I guess. Did you try to turn it? Well, no. Okay, so if, if we took it off this shelf, and we had to take it and put it over on this shelf over here, 
Does your body move? Sure it does. But you don't have to think about it. So the fact that we're standing there thinking about trying to make our body move, if your arms move in a certain area and your arms are going from here to here, it's likely, likely, that your body is going to pick up the motion of it. Now, I have a new granddaughter. She's just going to be a year old. But I've been filming the process of learning. And I've known what it is, but now I'm going to see it. And I'm going to help a lot of you with this because we learn, we learn movement patterns from tactile in. We don't learn them from core out. Now the body does initially does develop support to protect the spinal column, but here she is as a baby, and as she starts to get control over hands and arms, what starts to happen? Well, she wants to reach for something. She can't quite get to it. So what does the body do? It goes, oh, okay, here we go. So all of a sudden, the body starts to come into play because it starts to assist what you're trying to do with your hands and arms. Okay, so if you start, if these know what to do and they know the arc they're supposed to swing in, guess what starts to happen? Your body starts to move to accommodate what you're doing with your hands and arms. Now, we're going to start talking about how your body moves. So first, we've got this lever system. Now we've got your hands and arms swinging in an arc that's a consistent arc, right? Now, what your body has to do is, as your arms move, your body can't get in the way of your arms. What do I mean by that? Most of you have taken lessons. You've heard of what they call early extension. So people set up, they make a swing, they come down into the ball, and they're trying to get off their right side to clear their hips. So what happens? You move your body closer to the ball. What does that do to the path your arms are on? It gets in the way. So what has to happen is if my body moves out, my arms usually move out. So most amateurs, as soon as their body moves out, your arms go out and you come what they call across it or over the top. Now, if I go back and my right hip gets pushed out of the way and I create all this space, and I swing my arms into that space and I let my body go, that's about how simple a golf swing can be. So when you try to force your hips to resist or go, most of you get in trouble because your body's moving incorrectly or, or in the way of what your arms are trying to do. So you have to clear space. So when you set up and you go back, you've got to get this hip out of the way enough to clear space for your arms to swing on the right path into the ball. Everybody's talking about shallow the club. But what the heck does that mean? Well, it's the angle of approach that the club has into the ball. So when you're trying to get a shallower angle of approach, you have to have your body out of the way so that your arms and the club can come shallower into the ball more from the inside, which is what most everybody's trying to do. Now, if your body moves in your way, I mean, I guess you could drop the club behind your hands and yeah, on track man, it would say your numbers are better, but your arms, your body's in your way. Okay, so you gotta keep your body out of the way of your arms. Well, set up. Right hip gets out of the way, left hip gets out of the way. Now, we're going to go back to speed because this left hip thing, when I swing, when I come down into the ball, it's like the club shaft, the club, and my left hip are together. So as the club comes into the ball, my left leg pushes my left hip out of the way. Now, I'm not trying to turn my hips. See, this is twist my hips. I'm pushing this hip socket back and out of the way. And that timing of those two things is what creates the acceleration. That's the snap of the towel. So the people who are talking about the club's fit flipping, well, the reason it flips is because you get right here, and this hip doesn't, this leg doesn't keep pushing this hip out of the way. So the momentum of the club takes off, and what happens? The club flips. So the club passes your hand. Now, if I come into the ball, and as I'm coming into the ball, my left leg pushes my left hip out of the way, all of a sudden, the club is stable, my wrist does what it's supposed to do, and the flipping action, or the hand action, happens at the right time. So timing this motion, this leg pushing this hip out of the way, now has nothing to do with straightening your leg. Your leg might straighten though, but I can straighten my leg, and my hip doesn't do anything. Then I straighten my leg, my hip didn't move. So it's not straighten your leg. And you don't want to get here and try to twist your hips because my hip didn't move out of the way. So your body works in straight line forces. That's what it knows. 
So when I'm swinging, everything I'm feeling is 90 degree angles. So when I go back, what does it feel like? My right leg is pushing my right hip out of the way. When you look at it, what does it look like my hips did? They rotate. Was I, well, am I trying to turn my hips? I don't feel turn, nor did Nicholas. Jack told me he's never felt his hips, especially on the downswing, unwind. Do his hips unwind? Sure they do. But they do it because of how he uses the ground, where he pushes his hips off. So I push my right hip out of the way. And then as I'm coming down, my left leg pushes my left hip socket out of the way. But I don't feel any pressure in my lower back because I'm not restricting my hips and I'm not trying to get off my right side to clear my hips. So that little move, timing this lever system with how this leg pushes away, that's when you start to maximize the lever system. Now, if this happens too early, you leave the club behind you. So those forces don't match. If it stops, you flip. So that becomes a very important part of this whole deal. Now, we're going to get back to simulators. What you need to do, whether you have a club head speed analyzer like this little one here, it's a radar swing speed, or you have a big simulator like this, or what True Golf has is it's an in home system. And what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to try these things and be able to monitor what's happening with your actual club head speed. Now, if your club head speed goes up when you're doing something, you might want to go after it. But if you make a motion and your club head speed doesn't change and you're putting more effort into it, why would you go after that? Because a lot of times what's misleading is effort relative to results. So when you watch good players, what do you notice? Well, they stand there, they make a swing, they look effortless, but they create a lot of speed. What do you notice when you see amateurs? A lot of effort, not a lot of speed. So again, what creates that speed? So with true golf, this in-home system, this is why I really like this. We're hooked up to a, a, an analyzer here. So I set up, I get this set up, and then, then when I swing, it, it basically does exactly the same thing this is doing. Now that's gonna tell me, if this was a full club, it's gonna tell me what distance it went, it's gonna tell me my club head speed. See, there's all my numbers right there. All right, so I can take this in-home system and I can set it up and I say, okay, I'm going to try to hold the angle in my wrist. And I give it a swing and I go, okay, what did that do to you? How far did that go? And you watch it. And you can do the same thing with the big simulators. So we watch the numbers. And you go, oh, 190 some odd yards. Okay, so now this time I'm going to do this one. And I just feel like I just hit it with my hands. Very little effort. So my body didn't move much. Let's see what kind of club head speed that generated. So that was more club head speed. Okay, so you start, you start playing around with this thing. And you can find out what really creates speed. And this is where this has really helped me. Because I have a studio that has force plates and all these different things. And I'll stand there and I'll try things. Because I want to see. I'm trying to get keep my distance up and, and trying to keep my game as good as I can keep it. So I'll try different things. And I see what the numbers say. Now, a lot of times it feels to me like, oh, my gosh, the club head speed went way up. What actually happens? It doesn't do anything. Or a lot of times it goes down. So you got to be really careful about where you're going with speed. And that's where these things start to be really valuable, is they actually tell you if what you're doing is giving you the right impact or the right input. And so you don't spend time practicing something that feels like it's giving you one thing, but it's really not. And, and again, that's invaluable because you don't have time. All right, so we've got a lot of little different things here. And I want to just do a little bit of a review and then, again, if we have any questions, we'll try to take some questions. One thing that's critical when it comes to speed, you 
can't have tension. I don't care what sport you've ever played. If there's tension in your hands, arms, and shoulders, you're not going to create much speed. So the first thing you have to be aware of is what's the tension level that I want? And basically, the tension level you want in your hands, arms, and shoulders and body is the same tension level you'd have to throw a ball. And when I have most people throw a ball, the tension level relative to their golf swing changes dramatically. It goes way, way down. All right, so the first is identifying the tension level that you need. Then we're talking about once the tension level is gone, now what do you have? You have mobility in these joints. So because we have mobility in these joints, now all of a sudden you have full range of motion of the joints. So now what can happen is you get the most out of the joint capsule and the lever system that you're trying to use. All right, so once you kind of know the tension level that you want, now you've got to figure out how am I going to create speed first with my hands and arms. So if you, like I say, if you just sit in a chair and you feel how this works, so my right arm folds, this lever works, my left arm's fairly straight. Then basically I'm almost throwing the club head out here and it runs into the ball, then what happens? My left arm rotates and folds, my right arm straightens. What's my chest doing? And doing much through that area. So you, you figure out how do I create this speed with this? Now, once you can create that speed, then you say, okay, now what I want to do is now I want to make a little bit bigger swing, so now I'm going to involve my body a little bit. Here's what I will tell most of you. If you start out by using your body as a balancing, offsetting of forces rather than a creating force, you're going to be better. What do I mean by that? When I swing back, as the club's going back, as it's going this way, I'm pushing away from the club. So as the club goes back, my right leg's actually pushing my right hip this way. Now there's force in my right foot, but I'm pushing away from the club. Now when the club starts down and it's coming into the ball, this leg is then pushing away from that force. So I'm constantly pushing away from the momentum of the club. Okay, that's simple physics. When I go the opposite direction, something's going, that's the snap of the towel. It starts to accelerate. What I see with most people is they set up, they go back, and then they try to fire, and everything's going the same direction. So the momentum of the club, and everything's going the same direction. Well, you don't actually create more speed. You actually put the brakes on the club. So the first thing, get the tension out. Second thing, get the lever system to work. Third, start to get your body to move so it's the center, and it stabilizes the momentum of the club going around you. So it's a stabilizing force, your body, rather than a speed-producing force at first. Now, once you get pretty good at that, all right, now we can maybe talk about some of the things the tour players do. Now, we've had a number of questions. Uh, is there a difference, Call asks, is there a difference getting speed with a driver versus iron or fairway shots? It's the same. Speed is speed. Levers are levers. Uh, physics, gravity, momentum, they don't know what club you're using. They don't know what you're trying to do. They only know how those forces work. So. When I create speed with a 7-iron, it's the same way I create speed with a driver. They're, they're all the same. That's why once you feel how those forces work, it's like riding a bike. You don't forget it. And I really don't have rounds where I play terrible anymore. I hit it bad. Because I can feel how that club moves around me, and I can feel how my body moves to offset those forces. And when I tune into that, the positions of my swing are significantly better. And I'm not even trying to hit them. So it is the same. Now Dave asks, can you incorporate the molasca move with the stack and tilt swing? Well, okay, let's talk about men. There's a lot of ways to swing a golf club. And I'm not going to say there's one right and one wrong. But here's what I do, and here's what I'm doing on my site. I've had a very interesting career. I've learned a lot about the human body. I've taken a lot of lessons. I kind of understand what the body's designed to do. So when I look at a lot of different ideas that are out there, most of them I've done, stack and tilt, and most of these ideas are not new. That's first thing, let's just, just understand something. Anytime somebody says they have come up with something new in golf, they're pro it's probably not true. Because I can show you articles written about every idea in golf today that were written probably pre-1900s. 
So it's not new. The reason there aren't any really new big concepts out there, what hasn't changed in the last 200 years? The human body. So it can only move certain ways. And if you violate its design, you're going to have a problem. So what I do on my side is I look at these ideas, because I did it for me. First of all, do they violate how the body's designed to move? If it doesn't, okay, then I'm going to try it. Can I do it? Does it make me better? Now, if it does, I'm going to bring it to you, because I want people to be better. Now, if it violates what the body's designed to do, or I have a hard time doing it, most people are not going to be able to do it. Because I've spent a lot more time than most of you have hitting golf balls, training my hand, and I've got at least average to above average hand-eye coordination. So what I'm trying to show you is what I found to be the most effective and the most efficient, not only for the people I work with, but for me personally. And, and a lot of these different ideas, when you start looking at how guys are creating speed and all the things they're talking about, these alpha and beta forces and ground forces and jump up in the air and twist and do this and do that, a lot of them happen. A lot of biomechanically are correct, and you can create speed that way, but there's other ways to do it that are safer, that are more efficient, or at least as efficient, and I'm going to stick with those. So my commitment to everybody is to research and watch what's out there, and if something's better, I'm going to go with it. To this point right now, I haven't found too much better than what I've been able to figure out or help people help me understand what's going on. So again, when you start asking these questions, and we start getting into different swing methods, I could stand here and do stack and tilt, single plane, dual plane, golf machine, with let A swing, David Ledbetter's A swing. I can do them all and hit the ball pretty well. Why can't I? Because my hands are trained to control the club, and they know where impact is. Okay, so I can make almost any method work to some degree. Okay, we've got another question here from Corey. He says, in relation to squaring the face, does the shaft... Does the stiffer shaft help help a little with this? Square the face. Uh, not really. I mean, seriously, I can take a really stiff or I can take a, a regular shaft and still square the face fairly well because the momentum of the club, when it comes in, whether it's a stiff shaft or a regular shaft, the momentum of the club is basically at my grip. We didn't talk about grip. You'll have to go to Alaska Golf and look at the grip. But that tends to square the face for you. So there's not enough difference between regular and stiff relative to, for most people, where the amount of flex or kick or twist in the shaft is going to affect your ability to control the face angle. Now, it's the same with, with trajectory control. I mean, there's, there's, there's all kinds of ideas about stiffer shafts do this. Yeah, if you're that good. I mean, tour players will have certain shafts in their shorter irons and certain shafts in their longer irons. Why? Because they want to control the trajectory that the ball's going on. And, and shafts can help you control trajectory. But their hands, they've gotten to the point where they're really good with their hands. So you want a shaft, if you're going to go get fit for clubs, and you're looking at shafts, you want to go get fit with a shaft that brings your miss hits in. So it, it dials in, you get certain shafts and you'll start your, your pattern will be spread out and all of a sudden you'll find a shaft that maybe that tightens that pattern so your misses aren't as bad. You may not hit it quite as far, you know, but that doesn't matter. You want that dispersion to come in because the better your miss hits are, the better you are as a player. Okay, we got one more question here from Brian. He says, I hit more pure with a split grip, like the drill, one inch split. Can I golf with that split grip or is this killing distance? Now, split grip, for those of you who don't know, is where you take the club and you separate your hands. Now, what that separation does is it makes it really easy to leverage the club, really easy to leverage the club on the follow-through side. So he says, well, I hit it better when I just have about an inch of a split grip. So, I mean, I can hit it with a split grip, and I'm pretty good with that also. So is that going to kill you as a player? Your hands work a little more independent that way, and it creates, it really focuses on this lever system. And you can get to where you might overuse it a little bit. But what I ask most people to do is we start with the split grip, especially if you have young kids. Let them start with their grip split, because when they take the club back, they'll automatically lever it, and they'll lever it over here. 
when their hands are together, you know, they tend to use their elbows. When the split grip tends to get this lever system working. And then you work their hands closer and closer together. Uh, so one inch apart might be a little much. I started, when I started this game, I played with a 10 finger grip, which is an inch closer together than your split grip. And that's what I played with. College All-American won our state over with a 10 finger grip. Now, they had me put my hands together or overlap this finger. That got my hands to work a little more together, okay? But it's not a necessary thing. There are, there are a lot of players that I start with split grips. So you just play around with it and find what works for you. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank you everybody for tuning in. Sorry about the technical difficulties with sound. It's something we've got to keep working on. Again, true golf. I can't tell you how much this has helped me. And if you go to their website and you just type in, you go to their search, you go to their, their, their store, and you just type in Malaska Golf. There's a discount for the in-home swing unit. There's also a discount for their simulators. I mean, this is a great product. This in-home swing unit, I mean, most of you can certainly afford it. It's way under 500 bucks. Uh, it's something that you can practice at home. Uh, you, you don't need a lot of space. It gives you relevant numbers. Relevant numbers are the key. Now, this type of simulator situation, it's interesting where cost is going with a lot of these things. What's the biggest roadblock for most people in golf? It's time and cost are the two biggest things. And they say the game's really hard, which, yeah, it's hard, but it could be a lot easier. So the time and the cost, if all of a sudden you have access to it and you can go out when you want to go out in your garage, it doesn't take a lot of space, and you can hit balls and you can actually get better hitting balls in your garage than you do on the range. Why? Because you have relevant numbers. And the prices now are to the point where if you're serious about golf and you want to have time to practice and you want practice to be relevant to your time and not having to drive to the golf course, then these simulators, and simulator's a bad word now. I've told these guys at True Golf, you got, somehow we got to figure out how to get rid of that simulator. Because that kind of means it's not quite golf. This is more golf from the numbers perspective and the learning perspective than golf is itself because when people are out playing, they really don't know what happened to a shot. I mean, they see where it went, they don't know what caused it. So again, go on to True Golf's website, take a look at it. When you're practicing for distance, start with the lever system. Make sure that the tension's out and you've got the lever system working. Be really careful about watching what you're seeing on TV relative to what the tour players are doing and what the biomechanics people tell you is the most efficient way to create speed. I'm not going to argue with whether they're right or wrong. They're probably very right. The science is correct. But here's what I've also learned. Science is the study of what's happening. It's not necessarily the way to do it. So down the road, look at Molaska Golf. Don't just play golf. Understand it. We look forward to the next show. This is in month. We're going to keep trying to work on this audio and get all the glitches out. And it's all about me helping you play better golf and enjoy the game. Be sure to subscribe to my channel for regular updates and tips. Thanks for watching.